welcome to a WBBZ special presentation. My guest today is Father Joe Gatto, President Rector of the Christ of King Seminary. And Father Joe is one of the best, most intelligent, articulate communicators I've ever heard. And with that introduction, the pressure is on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for the compliment. And also thank you for letting me be here today. Well, uh, before we get into our topic, uh, a little birdie told me that you are a big Buffalo Bills fan. I'm a huge Bills fan. And you may even have a couple of Super Bowls under your belt. I have two Super Bowls under my belt. As a matter of fact, I was in Italy for the very first one, and I traveled from Rome to Tampa uh, to be there for the first one to go wide right. So, no. yes. Any, any favorite Bills moments? I have to say the comeback against Houston. There is no doubt. Being in the stadium that day was incredible. It sure was a high point. Um, we're talking about the seminary today. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ the King Semi Seminary is doing much better today than it has been in years gone by. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a reason that you can put your finger on for that? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very lucky that the bishop, Bishop Malone, invited me to be the president rector of Christ the King. And I've inherited a great tradition. We're talking about a tradition that's over 150 years old. And the seminary, in most people's minds, has been traditionally understood as a place where men prepare for priesthood. But Christ the King is much more than that. Christ the King is a school of theology. Uh, we have men and women who are getting graduate degrees. We have uh, certificate programs. Seminarians is our primary responsibility. We have a diaconate program, certificate program, high school retreats. We have a variety of things. And when you ask the question about why it may be doing better, as I think because people are coming to understand the important need of a place like Christ the King. Let me give you an example. Uh, a parish in Jamestown, a group of young people in Niagara Falls. Let's say a senior citizen who might be going into hospice because of a situation in their life. Many times the ministers who are in those circumstances are people who have gone to school, advanced in the area of ministry or their degree, and are graduates of Christ the King. There's a great need out there, and I think from the man who discerns priesthood, to the deacon, to the candidate, man and woman who is running a parish, to bringing communion to the sick, they realize that Christ the King is the place that they can prepare themselves for those types of ministry. So I think there's a variety of reasons why it's doing better, and uh, by God's grace, it is doing better. And it's a tremendous facility. You have a, a library there that's one of the biggest on the East Coast for philosophy, philosophy and religion, mm -hmm. and it's open to, to the public. Right. right. We have 132 acres on Knox Road, and I think sometimes it's one of the best kept secrets because we do have one of the best theological, philosophical libraries on the East Coast, bar none. Um, and it's about 170 to 180,000 volumes, plus all the access to the libraries literally around the country and around the world. Uh, but we also have, a, we have two lakes, a retreat center. We have places for couples to come for retreats. We have seven dormitories, a huge chapel. We just had an Advent prayer service. One of the things that I've been doing as I go around the diocese now that I just became re president rector is I've been going around telling people basically one thing. Everyone is welcome at Christ the King. There might be a reason to just come for a walk. Uh, I tell the priest, come spend a day and I'll pay for your tea fees at Craigborn uh, down the street. You know, a place to relax, a place to learn, a place to discern your ministry in the church. Uh, you were in charge at St. Gregory's in Amherst for several years. Mm -hmm. And now you're at the seminary. How is that different? What's your experience now? The joy of being a pastor uh, brings with it kind of an intimate relationship with your people an ability to be one-on-one -on -one with them in moments of celebration or moments of tragedy. What I get to do now is to pre prepare the ministers that will be in those specific situations. I love parish ministry. I love being a pastor. But I also know that when the bishop asked me, the first thing that went through my mind was, I can now help prepare people love priesthood as much as I do. I can prepare the catechist to teach in the classroom, to connect, connect with those people in an intimate, personal way, and to offer the gospel, to offer messages of hope, which our society so desperately needs. Um, one is the on-hands contact with the everyday people. The other is preparing the ministers to do the daily ministry as a deacon, as a lay man or woman in the church. Where would you like to see the seminary in, say, two, three, four years, and what's the biggest challenge in getting there? 
where would I like to see it? I'd like it to continue to move in the direction it's going. I would certainly love the numbers of seminarians, our primary ministry to increase. Uh, I'd like it to become a center for the spiritual growth of all of God's people in the eight counties of Western New York. We have seminarians coming from Canada. Uh, we're working with some religious communities, but I want it to be a place where we have a festival of faith. We have an afternoon of Catholic music and interdenominational prayer services and have a mass with the bishop. I want people to realize that the 132 acres that are out there literally is an extension of their own parish, their own community, and that they can come to Christ the King not because they're just coming for a class, but somehow they want to reconnect with themselves and their God and their faith and their prayer life. That's what and, I'm hoping for. And the challenges and getting there, what, what takes up your time in getting and growing the seminary? We are alive and well and moving forward. Getting that message out there. Um, I'm not saying it wasn't out there before, but if I ask most congregations or ask most people, do you know where the seminary is? Mm -hmm. Do you know what we do out there? Well, you prepare men for priesthood. Getting the word out, the publicity, a day like today, this conversation helps that. Uh, going around to parishes, meeting with people, getting the pastors on board. Uh, just that whole, basically, PR, we're alive, we're well and we're moving forward, and we are by God's grace, and because of a serious commitment on the part of our bishop, Bishop Malone. Okay, well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about religion in general and the challenges that uh, religion faces in the world today. Welcome back to our discussion with Father Joe Gatto. Today we're talking about Christ the King Seminary and religion in general. Right now I'd like to talk about uh, the Catholic religion in this country, in Western New York, and in the past generation it seems, and maybe this is just an image in, that I've observed, maybe it's not valid, but it seems that there's been less participation in the church over the last generation. And I'm just wondering if there's a a root cause of that. I know that the media has tended to, to, to go towards the left a little bit in the last generation, and the left tends to be a little bit secular, mm -hmm. and they, they downplay or minimize religion and, and sometimes mock the, the faithful, and I'm just wondering whether that's a contributor. Is there anything else going on? Well, if we look at today and we ask those questions, we kind of isolate ourselves. It's like putting our hand in front of our face and saying, well, I understand, but as it moves away, there are cycles, whether it's in religion or in government or ideologies. And I'd have to say that right now we're in a particular, as you use the terminology, a secular sa stage. Uh, but one of the things that I've discovered, you use the word religion. While I may say and agree with you that there is a decline in active participation in what we would call institutional organized religion, I have not seen a loss of the spiritual. Now people pick and choose, people join non-denominationals, they, they form their own churches, but we see this almost distrust of any type of structure, whether it's governmental, whether it's institutional, whether it's a religious institution, and I think that we are secularized and I do think people are searching for something. I have to say this, and it might sound too general, I've never come across anyone who I felt wasn't spiritual. I might have come across someone who was not religious, but uh, Father Richard Rohr says the purpose of religion is to bring about the transformation of the human person, to help them answer the human questions. And when an institution like the church doesn't do that, or a political institution, people become weary, they become skeptical, and the media will pounce on that. I think one of the great examples we have right now that the spiritual life and religion speaks even to this generation with all of its doubts and cynicism is Pope Francis. Why? because he who represents the institution, his words and his lifestyle are one and the same. That makes a huge difference, credibility. People are paying attention to religion and the Catholic Church in a way they haven't for years. Even, forgive me, President Obama has quoted Francis, the Pope of the Catholic Church, in some of his speeches. Why? Because there's a connection between what he says and who he is, and he lives the message. That's authentic spirituality, and that's authentic church. 
Well, I like to think that, uh, that because he's a Jesuit, we've fin <laughs> finally gotten it right. <laughs> oh, uh, there are some non-Jesuits who don't agree, but that's okay. Um, well, a lot of Catholics do come to Mass on Christmas and on Easter, mm -hmm. and they consider themselves spiritual, mm -hmm. but when you ask them about the church, they, they say basically what you said. They, it's a structured uh, institution with rules and regulations and edicts, and they consider themselves to be personally spiritual with God and, mm -hmm. and not accountable to a, an organized religion. Is, is that a bad thing? I mean, it's a good thing that they're spiritual, but they're not taking part. Yeah. You've opened up a big box, which basically, and I can't summarize it in a few seconds, but it seems to be the trend, what you said, that they're spiritual, but they do not belong to an institutional church, is the basic egocentric driven society. It's about me. If I believe in a religion, if I believe as a Catholic Christian that I am in relationship with the Lord, then not only do I have a responsibility to be personally in relationship, the way I live should affect others. So therefore I join myself to a believing community. Yeah, if you decide to be Catholic or Christian or Lutheran or Methodist or Buddhist or Jewish and say, yes, I am, but I don't attend the synagogue, I don't go to temple and I'm not gonna go to the chapel or whatever it is, then you're basically saying, I'm a part of the team, but I'm not gonna practice. I'm not going to be a benefit to anyone else. It almost seems a contradiction to say that because to be a faithful follower means that it's not just about me, it's about us, our world, and our society. Because real Christianity is also real anthropology. The way we can be authentically Christian helps us be authentically human, to be loving and caring. They're one and the same. I, do I think it's happening? Do I think people absent themselves and they come for Easter and Christmas? Yes, I do. But when the church is healthy, when they see authentic message, they come. And they come because it's nourishing them, their family, and it's making sense of life, love, and relationship. Well, communion, the concept of communion is not just communion with the Lord, but communion with the rest of the church mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a group, as a, as a body. Um, when you're not taking part in that, you're missing something. Mm -hmm. uh, well, think of your family. You know, I'm a member of a family, but I don't go to Easter uh, celebrations, I don't show for people's birthdays, I don't do any of that stuff. How are you building up your family? What about your chores at home? What about your responsibility to mom and dad as a kid in the family? It's the same type of principle. Um, but it's there. Right now the Diocese of Buffalo is putting forth a program called Come Home. And as I know the material says, and as I've spoken with the bishop and I've spoken with many people, we want people to come home to the church. We have to do two things. One, I believe that coming home is not just them coming to us. We have to go to them where they're at in their environment, in their circumstances, and help them. But the other thing is when they come home, we better be a little bit more authentic. We better be a better preaching church. We better be a better serving church, a welcoming church. And I think that's what the Diocese of Buffalo is trying to do with this new Come Home program. Uh, some people, and I'm sure you've run into this in your career maybe many times, People have a doubt about uh, God and Christianity and, and spiritual, spirituality in general. Mm -hmm. they have, they, because of the, the science of today and because of the, the way man has evolved, mm -hmm. it's harder to believe in something beyond what you can see. Oh, sure. And it, it, those people wonder, is, is God real? Is, relig is, is heaven real? And, how do you address that when people express that doubt to you? When people offer their life to me, their circumstance, when I find myself in the moment of uh, life and love and relationship and dying, the very fundamental human question comes into play. You know, is there a God? I believe, I truly do believe that when those normal events of everyday life, they force the question, they ask the question because no political ideology, no you know, candidate, no form of uh, institution or a new piece of software are going to deal with the human person. The human person has to ask the more fundamental question. And the very fact you ask, the very fact that you doubt, means what you're doing. You're searching for God, that God is there somehow in your life. Now, we have a lot of traditions and images in our head about what God is. And I think sometimes, myself as a priest and others, we have to 
we have to update that a little bit. You know, it's not necessarily a white guy with a, uh, uh, with a beard in heaven somewhere. You know, it's more than that. God is the great spirit. God is the great love, great, the great other, the great love, whatever it is. But I think the sacraments, I think the church, and I think the way we live our lives, uh, I would be hard pressed to say uh, from my own experience and having been involved in people's lives that there really is a true atheist out there. Hmm. Well, well, we'll take a, a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about religion throughout the world and some of the events that we see in the news every night. Welcome back to our discussion with Father Joe Gatto. Uh, Father, before the break, we talked a little bit about people uh, questioning whether there's God or whether there's something beyond us. Um, I once did a, a paper in college about how uh, you know, man in ancient history would worship the sun or worship fire or thunder, and as man became more sophisticated, his concept of God became more sophisticated. If we didn't have a God, we would invent one. Now, to people who think like that, who are mostly science oriented, that you know, basically everything is there because of just nature and, and it doesn't have anything to do with a, de a deity. How do we answer that question? How do we talk to people who tend to be more scientific than spiritual? Well, you, you created by your question a dichotomy between scientific and spiritual, and in fact, they're truly one and the same, because if science is true, if the way that we look at the world, it should then, as does history, as does experience, as as the sun sets and rises, and physics and biology, somehow have to point us to the origin of all that. And you can call it a Big Bang, you can call it the creation moment, you can call it Genesis, you can call it whatever you want, but reality, history, everyday experience should point us to what is true. And there has never been a time when somehow what creation and history hasn't pointed us to the truth that there's a greater creator, a God out there, that somehow, some way informs us and comes to us through history and time. When we sit here today, I'm pretty important. But when I look at myself in relationship to this studio into relation to Western New York, in relation to the United States, the hemisphere, the Milky Way galaxy, one galaxy in the midst of 120 million identified, I realize there's something greater out there than Joe Gatto. Our human situation posits the question of God, and we have to live in relationship to this reality, and we therefore understand that there is something greater, and we call it God. Um, in the world today, there's a lot of nightmarish events that are happening. Uh, we just heard about 120 or 130 children being killed in Pakistan mm -hmm. in the last day or two. Um, that behavior is being done in the name of religion. Uh, it, it, how can we justify, or not justify, but how can we reason and or understand. understand what goes through the people's minds that say, if we do a bad deed, we're doing a good deed in the, the eyes of our Lord? Mm -hmm. I think that we, obviously, whether it is Islam, whether it's Judaism, whether it's Christianity, we have to realize that there are holy good people in all of those, and we don't want to generalize and say that all of those people who belong to a particular religion or a sect are misusing quote-unquote religion, but there are those who do. And as I think I said to you in private conversation, uh, Father Richard Rohr says, religion is supposed to transform and make complete humanity. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't transform and when it doesn't answer the human question, it is inauthentic religion. Those individuals who choose to use violence to kind of somehow promote the presence of God or their religion is inauthentic. It is not true. It is not really to be encouraged to be believed. When Christianity, I mean, we had the Inquisition, we had the Crusades, we have gone through all kinds of histories of good moments for Catholic religion, just as other traditions have had their wonderful starry moments and they're very difficult. Religion that claims that somehow, some way, violence will bring about the fulfillment of God's promise I cannot believe in and nor can I condone and God's people and the world should not accept it as a valid expression of whatever tradition is promoting it. The, the loss of those children to somehow make a statement about who they are religiously 
has to be completely inconsistent with what God of any tradition would want to have happen. Well, that's a discussion that, that we could go on for a long time. Sure. And, and I think we'll do a whole show on that at some point. We'll happy to get you back and, and maybe get some other clergy in from other religions and talk about mm -hmm. you know, how well, things That was a differ. nice way to slide me back into another <laughs> show. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You promised now. Um, okay, uh, but you know what? Throughout history, there has been uh, greed and violence and, and just, you know, bad behavior. I mean, it's something that is, I think, in humanity itself. There's always mm -hmm. been evil in the history of mankind. Is that just something to be accepted, that it's always going to oh, be, no, no. you know, I, I just don't know how to reconcile the fact that in the, the history of mankind, there doesn't seem to be any progress. People are still doing horrendous things, what we would call inhuman things, mm -hmm. um, and it just doesn't seem to go away. I, I would like to come at that straight away, but I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, the only reason, not because I don't want to answer the question, but I want to come at it from the positive. In the midst of all of those atrocities, I think it's what you're referring to, whether it is a holocaust, whether it is the loss of life, two world wars, a global depression, and all the famine that we find in the world, in the midst of that, we find people like Francis and Claire. We find great holy people in the midst of that. So to begin by saying that all of humanity is doomed in a sense, there are some incredible gifts that humanity brings. And I believe, personally, as does the church, the Catholic church, in the great gift that human persons can become. But because of free will and because of choices people make, because of self-centeredness or egotism, or because of the capital desire for money, there's a lot of motivations for why people do what they do. And we also have to be responsible that the society that we have created doesn't lead to inauthentic behavior, but to authentic behavior. And that holiness is really not just a spiritual thing, but it's actually a cultural fulfillment of what we're called to be as people. I mean, when you stop and think of the great people who have led the United Nations, think of the great people who have given speeches and talk, think about the great charities, think about that young woman, Agnes, who gets off a train in India and becomes Mother Teresa of Calcutta in the midst of nothing, becomes something. And all of those women and men who follow, um, yes, it is a complicated world. Yes, there are people who make decisions that are unspeakable in many cases. But I like to also look at those people, those great men and women, who seem to have found authentic human existence through institutions, through a church, through a religion, particularly in our Catholic tradition. Well, in this, uh, the most holy part of the year for us, um, uh, let's get back to the seminary again. Are there special activities that are going to be happening at the seminary? We just had a Advent uh, Vesper service, which we uh, do every single year. Uh, right now we're actually on break like any college. Uh, most of the faculty, priests, or people go to their parishes and they help out. But what I'd like people to know is that the very mission of the seminary is Christmas-like. Mm -hmm. You know, Christ comes to birth for us in this very holy season, but at the very same time, what we do at the seminary is we're hoping that people will come to that Bethlehem moment, and they'll experience the child, and they'll experience Christ, and they'll come to realize that it's not just about them. Everything that we've been talking about, that when they're called to life and love and relationship and their vocation, that they're going to remember that Christmas is that place where they meet the Jesus who gives birth. And that's what I'm hoping the seminary will be, that encounter by doing scripture study, by going on retreat, having a spiritual experience. Christmas the, is not, sorry, mm -hmm. Christmas is not just the 25th of December. Mm -hmm. It's a way of life. The, um, the people who attend the seminary, who are studying for the clergy, what's their experience and how is it different from if they were to be going to any of the other colleges in the area? Well. They, of course, have an academic program they have to follow. They have to, by our accrediting agencies, they have to get so many credits and so many degrees so they can be professional in their occupation. But they have a whole horarium of morning prayer and mass. They do field education throughout the eight counties of western New York. They work in soup kitchens and they work at hospice uh, 
uh, places, uh, they do teaching and they do all kinds of things. Um, they have spiritual directors, they have formation directors. They're trying not only to create themselves as a vocationally competent person, but a spiritual person from the inside out and not just the outside in. Uh, so they have a full day of prayer and mass and they live there on campus, the seminarians who are preparing for priesthood. Uh, then the laymen and women who are getting degrees and everyone else, they go back to their everyday life with their husband and their children. Well, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful inst institution for Western New York, and I hope the people out there will get online and do a little research about the uh, seminary, find out a little bit about it, and perhaps visit. Uh, I think that that would be a, a, a great experience for any uh, Catholic or anyone in Western New York. Everyone really. is welcome of all traditions. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. We'll have you back again because there's a, a lot more to talk about when it comes to religion. Uh, that's all for this special presentation of WBBZ. Thank you for watching. <laughs>